Welcome to lecture number 27 of VCE 376, Embedded Systems, C Transforms. Now, a little bit of background. In Circuits 2, Electronics 2, we design filters in the S-plane. These include RC low-pass filters, RLC bandpass filters, and active filters. With circuits, any circuit with inductors and capacitors are described by differential equations. When dealing with differential equations, we use the Laplace operator, S, because with Laplace transforms, SY means the derivative of Y. So it's very easy to convert a differential equation into an algebraic equation in S, with the assumption that algebra is easier than calculus. Today we're going to look at digital filters. With a microprocessor, things are different. Typically with a microprocessor, I have some analog input X, and I sample it. Typically, every 10 milliseconds, or at some sampling rate T. I'll then take the sampled input, run it through an A to D converter, do something with the microprocessor, compute the output based upon the input, spit out the output to a DA converter, and that produces the output Y. Here what you have is, instead of the differential equation describing the system, it's really more of a difference equation where y of k is a function of y of k minus 1. The data at the subroutine is a function of what the previous data was, previous interrupt, two interrupts ago, three interrupts ago. The advantage of having a digital filter is that code that ran yesterday should run today. Um, that's not always true with op-amp circuits. Wires fall out, capacitors burn out. With software, I don't have DC offsets like you do with op-amps. If I want to build more complex controllers, it's easy. I just add more lines of code. It's easier adding more lines of code than building a new circuit. And if you want to change the controller, again, you don't have to change the circuit. Just download a new program. So software filters have a lot of advantages over hardware filters. The problem we have is the tool. The plus transforms describe differential equations. It doesn't work very well when dealing in software and difference equations. Uh, for example, a typical filter would look like this. I have a loop that's running every 10 milliseconds. Each time I go through the loop, time goes up by one sample. I'll read the analog input, do some computations, and then spit out the output. Here the variable y is the function of previous values, and the input and the previous inputs, where I measure these every 10 milliseconds. To describe this, I use a difference equation rather than a differential equation. So we need a mathematical tool that allows me to work with difference equations rather than differential equations. Uh, for Laplace transforms, again, what Laplace transforms do is they convert differential equations into algebraic equations in S. The way that works is they assume everything's in the form of e to the st. So when I take the derivative, I get s e to the st, or s times y. So s means derivative. I've converted my differential equation into an algebraic equation in S. By doing so, I can turn a transfer function into a differential equation, cross multiply, s squared y means the second derivative, plus 7 times sy, 7 times the derivative of y. And it goes the other way around. Given a differential equation, I can convert it into an algebraic equation in S. Z-transform is how you do that with difference equations. The assumption behind a Z-transform is that the constant sampling rate t so that time is my sample number k times my sampling rate, or just y of k for short. Assume that all functions are in the form of z to the k. What that does is when I go one sample in the future, I get z to the k plus 1, which is z times z to the k, or z times y. So in the z transform, zy means the next value of y. What the z transform does is it converts difference equations into algebraic equations in z. Uh, for example, suppose I have the following transfer function in z. To find out what the difference equation is, I cross multiply and then substitute. zy means the next value of y, or y one sample in the future. z cubed y is y three samples in the future. So this is the difference equation that corresponds to that transfer function. You can also do a change in variable and shift everything by three. An equivalent difference equation that's also correct is shift everything by three and this is also a valid difference equation. The second one is preferred because I'm not using any future values. I just have y of k, the present output, and the output one sample ago, two samples ago, three samples ago, and the input one sample ago, two samples ago, three samples ago. 
I can remember the past very easily, the future gets a little bit harder. But both equations are correct. Both are difference equations corresponding to that transfer function. What that does is this allows me to implement the code in software. If I have this difference equation, the way I implement it is almost the way I write it. In software, I have to come up with variables that the C will recognize. So just have x0 means x of k, x1 means x of k minus 1, x2, x of k minus 2. Throw them into a stack so that I remember the previous inputs, remember the previous outputs. Then my difference equation just shows up here in one line of code. The current output is the function of the output one sample ago, two samples ago, three samples ago, the input one sample ago, two samples ago, and three samples ago, and then spit out the output. The nice thing about difference equations is I can write the software exactly. There is no approximation. I don't have to use numerical integration. I can write it exactly. That's why we like Z-transforms with microprocessors. The implementation is very straightforward. Um, second example. Suppose I want to implement the following second order filter. And the trick is multiply it out, cross multiply, solve for the highest power. And there's y of k. In software, all I do is just change one line of code. Everything else stays the same. So that's the beauty of Z-transforms. If I want to change the filter, change one line of code, I've got a new filter. It's very easy to change filters in software. Um, so a couple things to note. In, in the Z domain, I can implement the filters exactly. To change the, the filter, I just have to change one line of code. Complex poles and zeros are very easy. It's just the rooster polynomial. I could really care less what the roots are. It's just a bunch of numbers. Also to note, in the S-plane, I don't like having more zeros than poles, because then I differentiate, and differentiation, differentiation amplifies noise. In the Z-plane, I cannot have more zeros than poles, because more zeros than poles means I'm predicting the future. That can't be done. Also, you have to have integer numbers in the S and the Z terms. Uh, S to the half, for example, means the half derivative, which doesn't make any sense. In the z-plane, z to the half means half an interrupt in the, in the future. And you can interrupt one time, I can interrupt twice, I can interrupt three times. You can't do half an interrupt. I can't call half a subroutine. So likewise, all the powers of z, z's have to be integers. To find the frequency response of a filter. In the s-plane, I let s go to j omega. In the z-plane, same thing. In the s-plane, y z to the st, if I sample every t seconds, t is kt, then y of k is e to the st to the k, which is z to the k. So the conversion from the s-plane to the z-plane is z is e to the st. If s goes to j omega, then z is e to the j omega t. And also note, if you have a ti calculator, ti calculators have to be in radians mode for this to work. HP calculators, they handle complex numbers just fine. They don't care. Uh, as an example, to analyze the filter. In the S-plane, if I have a second-order filter where the input's a sine wave, the way I analyze it is use phasers. The output is the gain of the filter at 4 ratings per second, times the phasor representation of the input at 4 ratings per second, which is 0 cosine minus j3, meaning 3 sine, and you get a complex number. The real part is cosine minus j is sine. In the Z-plane, it's almost the same. Here I have a filter in the Z-plane, I'll evaluate at 4 ratings per second, S is J4, Z is E to the ST, which is 1 at 2.2 degrees. Evaluate at that value of Z times the input, can 0 cosine 3 sine, and I get a complex number. Again, what that means, real part is cosine minus J is sine. So filter analysis in the Z-plane is just like the S-plane, except I now use Z as E to the ST, or E to the J omega T. And it's not really obvious, but it is a filter. For example, here's a discrete time filter where the input is a sine wave, the blue line. If the input is a sine wave, the output's a sine wave, the red line. It has a change in amplitude, has a time delay, has a phase shift, but it's still a sine wave. To represent the output, that's a complex number. So discrete time um, difference equations also have gain versus frequency. 
if I want to find the time response or step response of a filter in the z-plane, I can use a lookup table. In the s-plane, you have, typically use that table of Laplace transforms. In the z-plane, very similarly, we'll also use the table of z-transforms. To come up with the table, let's start with the, the, the most basic, the delta function. The z-transform of a delta function is 1. The delta function is a function which is 1 at k equals 0 and 0 other, otherwise. If I have a step input, a step input is 0 for time less than 0, 1 for time equal to 0 or more. To find the z-transform, one trick is let's multiply times 1 over z. z means the next value. Whenever z means delay, so let's take u of k and delay by 1. Now I'll subtract, and I get a delta function. I know the z-transform of a delta function, that's 1. So solving, u of k must be z over z minus 1. That's the z-transform of a unit step. If I have a decaying exponential, it goes from 1, a, a squared, a cubed, and so on. To find the z-transform, I can delay by 1, multiply by a, then subtract, this is a delta function, z transform of a delta function is 1, so solving, the z transform of x is z over z minus a. And if a is complex, I can also do z transform with complex numbers. The net result is the z transform for a delta function step decaying exponential and a oscillating decaying exponential are as follows. Note that there's always a z in the numerator, and for complex numbers, Polar form is easier to use. In polar form, the amplitude of your pole is your a to the k. The angle is the frequency of oscillation. And it turns out the term right here is the phase shift. Uh, for example, if I want to find the time response of this filter, the step response, I'll take my filter, take the z transform of the step, which is z over z minus 1, do partial fraction expansion. I'm going to pull out a z because my table z transforms out a z in the numerator. And now I've got 4z over z minus 1, which is 4, minus 4.5z over z minus 0.9, minus 4.5 times 0.9 to the k, plus 0.5 times 0.5 to the k. So there's your time response. If you have complex poles, similarly, do partial fraction expansion, where the amplitude of the pole is your 0.9 to the k, the angle is your frequency of oscillation. It shifts by 10 degrees every sample. And your phase shift is, turns out it's this guy right here. It's the one over the minus sign. You can also do time value money calculations with z-transforms. So suppose I borrow $100,000 for a house. How much do I have to pay over 10 years? Assuming 6% interest or 0.5% per month. To do that, I have this difference equation. My loan value at next month is 0.5% more than what my loan value is for this month, minus how much I paid for it, plus the initial loan at, t, at k equals 0. Take the z transform. The next value is zx. x just becomes 1.05x. Constant payments. The constant is z over z minus 1. And a delta function just becomes 1. So you bring the x0 right. To the left, I mean, gives you this function. Uh, solve. And this is the partial fraction expansion. Convert back to the time domain and plug in your endpoints. Initially, the loan was $100,000. Um, at 10 years, under 20 payments, I'm down to $0. Solve, and the payments are 1110 so that's my monthly payments. If I stretch it out to 30 years, my monthly payments become $5.99 a month. Essentially, that's what a business calculator does. It does a z-transform for you, but you, instead of having z, you just input the present value, the loan amount, and it does these computations. With z-transforms, you don't really need a business calculator. You can drive the monthly payments you have for uh, loans. So that's z-transforms. What we'll look at in our next lecture is using Z-transforms to analyze the filter.